Hey everybody, I am here to tell you about one of our new publications that is coming to you soon via Behavior Research Methods. And this was a presentation that we gave at the Society for Computers and Psychology, or SCIP. So what we were doing was looking at low quality data, especially data that you might get via uh, Amazon's Mechanical Turk or any other uh, time when you're using online participants. And we really wanted to find ways to screen this low quality data for um, automated answers. These are things like form fillers and for low effort responses. And so these are times when people just like click through and make patterns or they just click five the whole time, that sort of thing. And so we're really trying to help people come up with ways to data screen for um, any type of data that would be considered low quality because um, it's obviously automated data where they click a button and it fills in all the answers for them is not data that you want to use. So you can go to our um, open science page where we have everything from this project all in one place, um, including our uh, pre-registration for this project, our preprint, which explains in great detail everything we did, uh, the instructions for the actual experiment where we were testing all of our methods, and then everything you could ever want data-wise is also on GitHub. So to find the files that I'm going to talk about in this video, I would tell you to go to OSF and that from there you can download it um, or you can go to GitHub. My GitHub username is DoomLab, D-O-O-M-L-A-B. But mainly what we're working on today is in this example folder, there's this screening script that I've written to show you how this works and the data set I'm using will be uploaded soon. Uh, additionally, if you want to look at our manuscript, it's completely reproducible, written in Papaya, where you can recreate everything that we did, um, including the actual PDF, if you know how to do that. Uh, so you can look at the word, the, the text that we wrote in line with the scripts that we ran, if you're an R user and you're interested in that sort of thing. Um, I think I've written this script in such a way that you cannot get an error message, but if you do, let me know because I would love to be updating this in ways that is more accessible to more researchers. Additionally, we'll probably work on a Shiny application so that people who aren't our users can also use our scripts. Okay, all that being said, let us look at the actual function. So we wrote this function as a combination of all the different things we found in the manuscript that were ways to detect poor data. So all of these are justified and explained in our manuscript. Um, and I'll kind of give you a brief overview as I walk through them. So there's some explanation of arguments up here at the top. Um, so it creates a subset of data frame and I just changed the name of this to bad data frame. <laughs> so let me change that. Um, Actually, it doesn't do this anymore. We decided we didn't want that. Just kidding. So it does create a data frame of identified cases. So we've actually changed this to work a little better where it gives you more information. So I'm just take that out. So the function here is very long, but what it does is you're first gonna enter the name of the data frame that you're interested in using, and that should only be the values of the scales that you're interested in. So this is mainly for, um, matrix types questions where you have a participant answering like one to seven or one to four across 20 questions on one page. Now we're also gonna suggest you only do this by page. So if you have multiple pages of questions, you would screen each page separately. You could try to combine them, but I think it would be easier if you focused um, on doing this by page. Uh, so we would enter a data frame of only the scale values that we're interested in. So like questions one through 10 would go here. Uh, RT for re reaction times so or response latencies. This is the pay, the information that contains page timing. So if you're setting up an experiment in Qualtrics or SurveyMonkey and you have the option to turn on page timing, you should. This is not the experiment time. So it's not the complete survey response time. This is the time that it's a participant views a particular page of your study. And that is very useful because we can count the number of characters on that page. And that's what this last char is here. Um, so it's the number of characters on the page. So making the video also helps me find all my little typos. And by characters, what we mean is um, physical characters in English with spaces. 
So this is a measure of how many characters are having to read. The citation for where we got our character limits is in our paper. Um, it's also in the, uh, there's a link to the paper in the markdown. And that contains like a bunch of different languages. So if you are trying to do this study in Spanish, you could create your own character limits by using that citation. So this is manipulatable in many ways, but especially if you want to change the upper and lower limits of what you find acceptable. So we really want people to be able to use these ideas based on their own criterion from their own uh, research, but you just need to justify your choices. Okay. So uh, RT here for the, the column name that has the page timing and char here for how many characters there are on the page. Since we're using Likert scale data, we're testing that. So we want to put in the min as in the minimum number that they can select and the maximum number. So here, um, the example might be one to seven. Uh, you will want to data screen your data set for accuracy before you do this. So if Qualtrics codes this as one to four and it's supposed to be zero to three, this is not gonna be very happy with you because the min and the max don't match. So be sure you go ahead and uh, fix any inaccurate data points before you get to this part. Okay. Part knows for participant number, this will allow you to take the data frame that this function spits out and merge it back into your original data frame. It just gives you a way to identify who these participants are that are good or bad. Okay. Menvec here is the um, column name for any manipulation checks that you have. So these are questions like, um, please mark strongly agree to this item. And this is really for ones that are embedded on the same page so they'll be part of the character count. Um, or if you have a separate one, this will also check it. So if it's on a different page. Uh, man core is the correct answer for that manipulation check. So if you said, please strong, mark strongly agree, it might be seven there. Now, the, if you're an R junkie, you can walk through. We've tried to comment a lot of like where things start and stop. Um, and we'll certainly take questions on anything we did. But what happens is for, um, the first thing it checks is the number of scale options. So what we found in our study is that um, people, normal people doing the study for real do not use the entire scale. They tend to use half or less of the scale. So what will happen in this part of the function is it will count the number of options they used based on your min and max. And it will mark them as a bad participant if they used more than half of the scale. So on a four item scale, so one, two, three, four, that means they use three or more items. On a seven item scale, that is five or more items. So um, we round it up from four. So it's something more than half of the scale. Okay. Uh, so you'll see here the function for that. It, it takes how many options you have between min and max, divides it literally in half, and then adds one to it. Um, one, four, you know, a four, a seven item scale, that's actually gonna round up to 5.5. So we may consider rounding this to the nearest whole number, but this is more than half of the scale. For the response or page time, um, what's happening here is it is taking your number of characters, and then these two parts here are about English. So um, if this is not, if your study is not in English, you should change this. The mean number of characters read in a minute in English is 987, and they had a standard deviation for that. So what we are doing is creating an upper bound for the um, mean number, or the characters that people should have read on a page in a specific amount of time, and making that a cutoff score in seconds. Um, and that's because Qualtrics here provides us the number of seconds on a page. And so we're just making a, a score for how fast they sh could have read this page. Okay. Now we did an upper limit of two standard deviations above because we know people tend to skim these things. But if they're reading it faster than two standard deviations past English reading speeds, we are assuming that they are not really reading the page that they're on. And then this section here codes them if they are faster than two times the uh, reading or two standard deviations above a mean character speed. 
And we found that character worked better than words because word length is unpredictable, but characters are um, much easier to count. Click counts. Click counts are very fascinating because automated form fillers where you push one button and it fills in the entire scale for you. This is easily downloadable through like say a plugin browser like Chrome's plugin browser. Um, but what happens is that when the person, you know, clicks the button to fill in the entire page, the survey program does not register any mouse clicks. And so this section really is looking for automated data where someone has just completely filled in the scale. Uh, the other interesting thing about when people use these form, these form fillers is that the distribution of that data um, appears to be uniform. So it randomly picks, uh, or it you know, kind of picks from one to seven and it fills them in fairly evenly. So that's really nice because real participants don't do that. Um, and so what we can do is check and make sure there are at least the same number of mouse clicks on the page as there are answers. So this will check if they had 20 questions and they answered all 20 of them, there should be at least 20 mouse clicks. Sometimes there's more because people miss or they change their answer. If there's less than 20 mouse clicks, something's going on. And especially if the, the answer is zero. Um, so what we found was that for these automated form fillers, the click count was zero or one or two where participants were trying to hit the submit button and missed. And so this allows you to look for participants who do not have enough clicks for the answers that they gave. Okay. And so what that'll do is it'll take that click count column and translate that into you know, more than you know, enough clicks versus not enough clicks. If you have a manipulation check question, this will just check and make sure that the manipulation check um, question is correct. So if they were supposed to mark four and they marked four, they get uh, a good score. If the answer is NA and they left it blank, it will actually give them a bad score here because they have not actually answered the manipulation check. Now, the other thing we did to try to handle this um, number of scale options question, because maybe a participant really did mean to pick one through seven. Uh, and they're one of the weird ones, or uh, maybe you don't, you know, you're not sure about the, the distribution of items, or there's only a small number of items. Uh, this was not the best discriminator in our study, but we left it in as an option. And what happens is it tests for a normal and a uniform distribution. Now, we can't honestly say that this is normal or this is uniform, but what it does is it um, creates normal and uniform distributions and then test the participants data against those distributions and kind of pick which one matches better. And so if you're interested in that, it's based on a chi-square analysis. Essentially, we bend the data um, and then test which chi-square is closer to zero, which means that it would match better in a very like kind of structural equation modeling way where lower chi-squares mean better matches between distribution and real data. Uh, so this Z normal here is the um, uh, translation of the normal distribution. Um, if a participant only picks one option though, that really screws this whole thing up <laughs> because there is no distribution at that point. It's literally one option. So if they pick one option, um, we kind of dealt with that fact, first of all saying, okay, you know, they've only picked one option. Um, and then we've recoded it where um, normal distributions are better and uniform distributions are worse because um, of the fact that we found that bot data, people tend to pick, or automated data, um, people pick, uh, not people, the computer uh, picks an even number of responses from every response choice. Um, but this will also code people who pick an even number of four and fives. So uh, it's not the best discriminator, but it, in tandem with other things, was helpful to have multiple discriminators. All right, the last thing that the function does is it adds all those up and creates you a little data frame of every single option that we've listed um, and whether or not the participant was bad. So this is true false coding where um, zero is okay. They are okay participant. One is bad. They were marked as a um, having a bad score on that particular item. 
And so it also gives you a total. If you have all five of these things in your study, we recommended you say that anyone who has at least two indicators or more is bad. Um, because what we found across our testing is that when you have Confederates play along and actually try this out, um, what we see, freaking family is text messaging me right now. Um, so what we see when you do this study, is, when you like look at uh, Confederates in a study is that um, bad participants will have at least two of these indicators or more. However, I recommend just screening your data and thinking about what this means for you. Do you expect people to pick the entire scale of the data? If you do, then maybe you don't want to use this bad scale check option. Or maybe you only have two of these particular things. You have page timing and you have a manipulation check. Well, then two might still be a good indicator for you, but maybe one is a better indicator. So we're suggesting two based on our study. Um, but that is not a golden rule or a line in the sand that you should use. You should think about your own work and justify why two or maybe four or maybe one is good for you. All right, so let's run that. Since this is not part of the package, you will have to run this every time you want to use it. And then I'm going to pull in some data from a current thesis project. This is not data that we used in our study. This is a new thesis where we did most of these things. So we did not actually use manipulation checks in the study because I wasn't thinking. And so um, I'll show you an example of with and without a manipulation check. Okay. One thing you'll want to make sure that you have in your data set is a um, participant number in some form so that you can match your data frame you're about to get out of this function to the original data set. So I'm gonna add a participant number, and then I'm gonna subset this down to only the first 10 rows because uh, this is not a fast function. Uh, so the uniform distribution tech checking part is very slow. Um, and by slow, I mean it's a couple of minutes long, but you don't want to watch a couple of minutes of my dead screen. So I'm just going to show you the first 10 participants in this study. You would actually want to do this on all of your participants, but maybe have time to make a sandwich in the middle if you have thousands of participants. Just not telling you. Okay. So the first thing you'd want to do is look at the names in your data set. So this study is on um, post-traumatic stress in first responders. And I'm going to check this LGS scale as my first one because we have page timing for that scale. And then we clearly have a second page, so I would also wanna check this one um, second. So I'm gonna break this down by page because the timing per page is more helpful to me. So this function really only works on like pages at a time. Okay. All right, so I told it to only check 13, column 13 here through 32, because that's where my real items are. So I said the data frame is in my master data set of those items. Okay. My response page time is this LGS time option. Okay, we renamed that from Qualtrics. It gave us like um, Q something time, whatever, but we just renamed it to know what it was. Okay. Um, click count here. Oops, I got excited. Uh, page time here. The min on this scale is one. The max on this scale is four. It's actually zero to three, but I haven't data screened it yet. So in this example, it's one to four. Participant number is that participant number I just made. My click count is under click count here. And I don't have a manipulation check, so I would leave those as null. Null is the default in the function, but it'll help if you just include them there. Okay, Characters here, there were 14, 14 characters on that page. So I'm going to run that. So let us view now what we got out of that. So what's happening here is at each column is one of the checks that we had. Here's our participant number again, just so that we could match them together. So I could merge this back into my data set. And I have um, a bad character count. So you'll notice some NAs here. That is because the participant page time here was blank. So if I also view the master data set, and I scroll over to those items, I can see 
that those participants just closed their survey. So this will actually tell me that those people did not look at that page. Okay, this is an imperfect function because um, some of these two will always give you numbers no matter what, just because it was not working correctly when I tried to do NAs. Um, but I think across all of this, you'll know because you'll have data screened a lot of these NAs out. Okay. So for bad characters, um, how fast are people reading this page? Um, I only have one participant here, participant 10, who appears to have read it too fast. Okay, so one bad data point. If I look at the master data set here, that participant 10 down here um, took only a minute on this page. Now, if I wanted to know what that cutoff score was, I can just kind of come back up here and say, okay, well, our characters on our page was 1414. A little bit of math here. So the upper character limit for reading speeds in English, if I multiply that by two times the standard deviation, is 1223. So our cutoff score is our characters divided by the upper number of characters times 60 for 60 seconds. And so that is they needed to spend at least 69 seconds on the page. There were 1400 characters. 1,200 characters takes about a minute um, at the fastest speed. And what we see is this particular participant only spent 64 seconds on that page. Okay. You can manipulate these numbers to whatever you would like them to be. Um, so if you wanted to maybe say three times the standard deviation, you could do that as well. So we would just edit right here on the number of characters. All right, going back here, back click. Well, our click counts all look okay, so every participant clicked at least 20 times, okay, or at least the number of clicks that uh, are the number of items that were on a page. So if a person quits halfway through and they clicked at least, you know, half of the number of items, this will say that they are okay. okay. Bad distribution here, that means that their distribution wasn't close to normal, so nobody looked bad. Now, it does give zeros to the people who um, don't see anything, but um, hopefully by this point, you'll have kind of dealt with some of the NAs. Oops, wrong way. Uh, here we go. Bad skill check. Uh, so bad skill check here is that people are using uh, half or more of the items. So we've kind of got a mixed bag here, but it looks like a lot of the participants in this particular study are using more than half of the items. Well, what that means is if I look at the items here, that means they're using one, two, three, and four, or at least one, two, three, two, three, four, you get the idea here. And in this particular example, they are using a lot of the different items here. So almost every participant has marked, just kind of visually, I can tell at least three of the four options. And so this scale check option was very useful in our study, but we did it on a one to seven scale. So it could easily not be as useful for a smaller number of response options. On a one to seven scale, it was very distinct um, on how many options people used. So if you wanted to change this, and I may edit this just a little bit to make sure this number is a whole number, um, you could edit here, up here on the number of scale options. This is the part that decides how many options they use is bad. So what's happening here is it's marking the number of people who use, or I'm sorry, it's marking the people who use at least equal to or more than half. So um, what we want to think about here is like, what, what does that mean for this scale? So for this particular scale, I might say here we're using um, all four options. So you can kind of play here with what the limit on the number of options they're using is. And remember that's options um, like uh, response choices on your scale. Okay. So we said more than half. So we did half plus one. Okay. Bad um, manipulation check here. This is all NA because I didn't have one of those. And then bad total here is how many out of the five um, that I had. So I would only have one participant that maybe I was like a little suspicious of in this study because they um, read the scale too fast and used all of the options. Okay. So I could decide to subset this participant out. Okay. Better yet, 
what I can do is run this on another page in the study. So now I've got multiple, multiple measures. In this particular example, I made up a uh, manipulation check so you could see what this looks like. Um, I just said MLQ1, they should answer four. Now that's a real question. I didn't, you know, you shouldn't do this on a real question. You should do this on a question that you specifically said, like, please answer three to this question. Um, but uh, what I did for that was I picked the questions that have the MLQ. I found the response time for that one. The min and max for this scale are one to seven. Same participant number, click count. My fake manipulation check question. Um, the correct answer in this case is four, just for fun. And the character count on that page was 841 characters. So let's try that. And now let's view that one. Now for this one, again, that one participant is reading way too fast. And so if I wanted to figure out what way too fast was, I could rerun some of this up here. Okay. And so I could say, um, our characters in this case is 841. And so our cutoff characters, just recreate the wheel here, is 41 seconds. So 841 divided by 1223 times 60. That participant, if I scroll over to that set of questions here, did this whole thing in 21 seconds. So they're going half as fast as we would expect them. So that might be a good indicator that it's problematic. Going back over here, bad click. Still, everybody's got the uh, number of clicks that I might expect. No bad distributions on this one. Um, bad scale check, see how it's a little bit more distinguishable this time. It marked pretty much everybody. It marked pretty much everybody on a one to four scale, but on a one to seven scale, it's only marking three people. So this might be a little bit better um, because there are more scale options and people tend to have a response pattern where they do not pick the entire scale. All right, so the glory of <laughs> offline uh, video recording is that when you realize that your function has a mistake, you can fix it and pow, pow it's, bare, it's better instantly. So <laughs> I fixed my typo that I had in here. Now let's talk about the bad manipulation check because those numbers should be zeros and ones. Uh, so here I coded every person who did not mark four as a one and who did mark four as a zero. So, or if they did not answer the question, they got a bad answer for that because they didn't answer the question. But again, I'd recommend this type of screening after you deal with missing data. Um, all right, so if I come over here and look at my master, uh, it gave these participants um, all ones up here because they answered six, five, nothing, and seven. Um, so that is why there are a bunch of ones. Now our total here is um, uh, a total of all the different ones. So this actual participant here would be our problematic one because they used more of the scale than one would expect and they missed the manipulation, the fake manipulation check here. Now if I have multiple pages, um, which is here I do, I have like five or six of these pages. What I might consider doing is adding up all of the totals across um, each of these pages. But pages need to be screened separately because they have different character counts and page timings. I guess you could combine them all together, but when you have a one to four scale on one and a one to seven scale on the other, that won't work. So I would screen each page separately here and then maybe add them together or um, look at the number of times a participant has uh, been flagged on a particular page and see if they're flagged on every single page, get rid of them. So there's a lot of ways to um, adapt our function here for your purposes. Uh, and really like uh, get down into thinking about what would I expect my participants to do in this study? So if you've used a scale 100 times and you know that they only pick the ends, well, then it might be useful to think about, um, you know, if they answer more than half of the scale options, 
then that's a real good indicator that they're just screwing around. However, if you know that on a particular scale that you use that people tend to pick all like a whole continuum and the distribution's rather flat, that's not gonna be a very good marker between low quality and automated data. Uh, so this might, it's kind of useful to think about the scale itself, what happens within the scale. Um, and then when you think about um, page response time, obviously very, very long response times too might be problematic because what is the participant doing for that long? And at the moment, we're only screening for the lower end where they're reading too fast because we think that that implies that they're just like click, 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 move on. So you could always think too about changing the um, timing for those in a specific way that meets or suits your data. We based this on research that showed re you know, normal English reading times. Like I said, the article that we cite in our paper is really fantastic. It's also open um, where they have a, a whole list of different languages. So um, we did ours in English because we speak English and we were doing things in English, but there are other languages to help make this more applicable across um, lots of different researchers. Uh, I highly recommend adding response times and click counts to your study if you can. Those were very, very good at denoting low quality data in our study. And uh, manipulation checks are quick and easy and will catch a lot of crap. <laughs> so um, kind of take all of these together. And then also gonna give a plug for pre-registering your, um, your choices for these sorts of things for future data. Um, data screening. So if you're doing like OSF's pre-registration form and ask you about data screening, uh, you could talk about how you're going to use some of these, all of these, part of these as part of your screening criteria, which is what we're going to be doing in the future. So all together, this is how you new, use our new screening function. Look for a shiny app for you non-R people soon, and um, you'll be able to just uh, upload your data on our server. It will not run very fast because our server is a computer sitting next to my feet, but uh, you could use that if you are not a, um, a, you know, not good at R. So thanks for listening. And that's all about our survey automation detection renamed low quality data manuscript.